former journalist, newspaper editor and publisher from World War I. Appointed editor of the Daily Advertiser in 1991 at the age of just 27, he was the youngest editor of the Daily Newspaper in Australasia at the time. During his career at the newspaper, Mr McCormack was a champion of many community issues. He played a significant part in helping save World War II's Royal Australian Air Force Base from closure in 1997, which not only resulted in the retention of the base, but the expansion of its role in the region. Mr McCormack was appointed a Justice of the Peace in New South Wales in 1999 and co-founded a media and publishing small business in Wagga Wagga, which he owned and operated in partnership until he was elected to Parliament in 2010. Mr McCormack has held the seat of Riverina for the National Party since 2010. In 2013, he was made Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Finance before becoming Assistant Minister to the Deputy <coughs> Prime Minister in 2015 then Assistant Minister for Defence in 2016. He has spent time in charge of several departments as Minister for Veterans Affairs, Minister for Defence Personnel, and Minister for Small Business. Mr McCormack is part of a government that has cut small business tax rate to 27.5%, its lowest level since the Second World War, and more small businesses are also eligible for the $20,000 instant asset write-off to purchase new equipment. He was elected leader of the Federal Parliamentary National Party in February of this year, a position that brought with it the title of Deputy Prime Minister. He also holds the portfolio of Minister for Transport and Infrastructure, so he has a thorough understanding of the issues facing your industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honourable Michael McCormack.
in hiring people, whether it's that young Australian uh, looking for their first job, or indeed an older Australian who might be transitioning from one long career into uh, to something in their twilight years of their uh, of their occupations of their working career uh, with uh, the automotive industry. We have a partnership between industry and government to achieve success, and I indeed note to the data on new car dealers playing a vital economic role in cities and regions throughout Australia, where they employ 70,000 staff and contribute some $15 million to the economy, as we heard uh, on the, uh, the opening uh, video, which I have to say, I was very pleased to see uh, Wagga Wagga front and centre. I take umbrage from the fact that it was called a small town. It's in fact the largest inland city in New South Wales, and so large, uh, it is the only inland city with all three arms of the defence. Believe it or not, uh, we've got an Air Force base where if you spend any given time in the Royal Australian Air Force, you end up in Forest Hill at Wagga Wagga. And every new recruit in the Australian Army does their basic training at Kapuka, Blaine Barracks, home of the soldier. And indeed, we should be very fascinated to know this. Uh, we have uh, the um, we have an inland navy base. Just don't tell anyone this. The government is spending a record amount of money on transport infrastructure over the next decade, seventy-five billion dollars, in fact. And it's a commitment that we've made to make sure that we have not just uh, a commitment to lowering congestion in our capital cities. And that's so important because uh, uh, so many of our population, uh, so much of our population indeed lives in uh, Sydney, Brisbane and Melbourne, and indeed the Gold Coast right here. But uh, also the fact that uh, we need to make sure we have that regional connectivity. We've just uh, we've signed uh, a free trade agreement uh, with Peru in recent times, uh, a deal with Indonesia last weekend, uh, building on our successes with uh, uh, South Korea, China, Japan and the Trans-Pacific Partnership 11, a $13.3 trillion opportunity for Australian uh, farmers, small businesses and particularly those in our regions. And so we need uh, the best roads, we need the best access from farm gate or small business, uh, be it in outback, rural, remote, <coughs> regional Australia, uh, to ports so that we can get access, clear access to those markets. And in the last budget, we committed an additional $24.5 billion dollars to new infrastructure. And I was particularly pleased when uh, I did become the uh, Transport Infrastructure Minister because it gave me the opportunity to fulfil, I suppose, the commitment to a group captain in Amberley, uh, the RAF base uh, in Queensland, where I visited there late last year as the Small Business Minister, uh, just before I became the Veterans Affairs Minister. And uh, I looked across at this other land group captain and I said to him, if you were me, uh, what would you do? And he said, if I were you, I would... See that road out there? And he pointed out the window, he said, I would fix that road because he said, this is one of, if not the largest Air Force bases in Australia. We have thousands of employees here and uh, that road cutting out highways is an accident waiting to happen and sadly one day it's going to be uh, a dreadful pilot. He said it's uh, just near an Amberley interchange. He said it's uh, a road that really needs fixing. And I said, look, I'm not the... Uh, I'm not the Roads Minister, but I'll, I'll certainly pass it on. Well, six weeks later, I was in fact the Roads Transport Minister. <laughs> <laughs> and it placed a little bit of pressure on me. And so I asked the uh, department for the, uh, the road priorities for Queensland, and, uh, and I noticed that the Amberley interchange, the cutting in the highway section of this, uh, uh, this particular rat face, was not on the priority list. Uh, it was, on, in fact, on a secondary priority list. And I said to the departmental official, what would make that get on the priority list? He said, you're the minister, you'll say so, sir. It was like being one of those episodes of Utopia or Yes Minister. <laughs> and so I said, all right, well, let's put that on the priority list. Not because we were going to win the seat any time soon, we won't. Not because uh, uh, it was uh, on the priority list, because it wasn't. But because it was the right thing to do. Sometimes... Things that are the right thing to do aren't always on the priorities. Sometimes things that are the right thing to do uh, don't always get the funding they deserve. But when you are actually able to make the change, uh, you should do it. And uh, I know that uh, when, where, uh, when, when I was looking at the Bruce Highway commitments, uh, I am a colleague of a fellow called Lou O'Brien. Lou uh, is a wonderful fellow. He's the member for Wide Bay following on from Warren Trust, who, of course, as you know, was the Deputy Prime Minister 
uh, not that long ago, and, uh, and Lou uh, was a highway patrol officer, a policeman who had far too often, far too many times, done the 3 a.m. death knock to tell people that their loved ones weren't coming home because there'd, there'd been an accident on the Bruce Highway, the Section D it's called, between uh, Kuru and Curra, and uh, it's otherwise known as the Gimby Bypass, or will be called that. And, uh, and certainly uh, Lou was a, you know, Lou had entered Parliament because he wanted to make a difference, he wanted to make a change, he wanted to see that Bruce Highway funded as it should have been many years ago. And he fought hard, and I know when uh, we, we funded it uh, as part of this year's budgetary process, finally, after all these years, $800 million dedicated, uh, the state government here chipped in $200 million, a $1 billion investment uh, to save lives, to make sure that the Bruce Highway get, got that duplication in that section that it needed, not just for the truck drivers, but for the car drivers, not just for Australians, but our international tourists. And when I stood at the press conference with Lou announcing it, he became quite teary and quite emotional. I've never seen that side of him before. But he knew that uh, that, that commitment would save lives. And there will be people in the future uh, whose lives will be saved. I'll never know that. But their lives will be saved because of that commitment that we as a government have made. And we should be doing those sorts of things too. It's a shame that we can't invest in all the roads that uh, you know, need upgrading. But we're certainly working towards it over that, as I say, decade-long pipeline of investment. And of course, uh, you people play a part in that too because of your advocacy, your strong ability to be able to uh, walk the halls of Parliament, as uh, David often does, uh, to tell us what we need to, uh, to hear and also the fact that uh, we get out amongst our communities as members of Parliament and not always talk, but more importantly listen. As a politician, it's much more important to do the listening than it is to do the talking. Uh, we've got a long-term planning commitment uh, as well as funding any new projects uh, in this year's budget. Uh, it's also supporting uh, future investment uh, through three major initiatives, one of which is the Roads of Strategic Importance, a $3.5 billion commitment. $1.5 billion uh, is going towards developing the north, so it's north of the Tropic of Capricorn, uh, to make sure that we have those key uh, road freight corridors. Our freight task is expected to double over the next 20 years. May that happen? But we need to uh, be able to be prepared uh, to ensure that if and when it does happen, that we've got the, road, the right road network to ensure that we have that uh, connectivity. And of course, we do have a strategy to develop Northern Australia. We've also announced a $1 billion uh, commitment to an urban congestion initiative, uh, which will complement uh, the Road to Strategic Important Initiative, reducing the time frame uh, that it takes to get uh, freight uh, to its final destination and making sure that with the congestion busting initiatives that uh, we build the right roads in Sydney, in Melbourne, uh, in, at the Gold Coast, in Brisbane, uh, to get people home sooner and safer. And sometimes when you talk about dollar amounts, people's eyes just glaze over. But when you can say that, uh, you know, for instance, the Beerburrum to Nambour rail line is going to save them 40 minutes of time, they think to themselves, yeah, well, that's, that's good because I can, that's less time I would have to spend in a car if I decide to take the road, or less time I have to spend indeed in the train. It's actually more time I can spend with my family, and that's so, so very important. And we're also contributing uh, a quarter of a billion dollars to a new major project business case fund for planned significant projects that demonstrate strategic merit so that we can have a good basis to decide whether they should be investment priorities at some time in the future, so that planning ahead. And, uh, and I always love when you do as a politician, and I'm a, an ex-journalist, as uh, was indicated, uh, when in fact I became the editor of the paper in Wagga Wagga, believe it or not, I had 58 journalists who worked for me. That's a significant number, though, the hitting days in the newspaper industry. And, uh, and when I was being in, and, and one of the great things about uh, being a politician, I can remember when I was in sixth class and I travelled to Canberra for the, uh, the usual uh, uh, excursion that all, well, most kids in, uh, in Australia and certainly in New South Wales schools do. And when I got off the bus and we were being lined up, uh, Malcolm, uh, uh, Malcolm Fraser was the then Prime Minister, and he was being interviewed on the steps of Parliament House. And I thought, how cool would that job be? You know, getting interviewed on the steps of Parliament House. Let me tell you, as a politician, as the Deputy Prime Minister, there's nothing cool about being interviewed on the steps of Parliament House because they ask you questions that you're not always 
uh, really either wanting to answer or know the answer to. So, um, but uh, AD, I was at uh, Darwin recently and we were announcing uh, a new road project there, a duplication of a road from the university into Darwin. We talked about easing congestion. The reporter quizzically asked, well, I don't think there's much congestion in Darwin. Can you please explain? But the reporter could not understand, couldn't get their head around the fact that this was planning for the future and kept arguing about the fact that this was not needed now. It wouldn't be needed for another at least five to seven years. But I think that's a measure of the government when we are, in fact, uh, planning ahead five to seven years uh, because that's being prepared for the future building the roads, not just for now, but indeed for the future. And so, uh, in, wherever you go in any state in Australia, we're making sure that uh, you know, we're, we're planning uh, ahead. But I'd like to turn now to developments in transport technology. I know Wes certainly mentioned this in his wonderful address. We are approaching the stage where highly automated and connected vehicles will become commercially available in the next few years. And all of us, government and uh, you people in the industry are having to deal with the complexities, the challenges, and the opportunities of these technologies. Adjustment can be difficult and will put pressure on all segments of the supply chain to find new business models to remain competitive. But these pressures will usher in new investments, new innovations, and certainly, as I said, new opportunities. The first role for government must be to ensure that we have the policy and the regulatory frameworks in place so Australian businesses are not impacted too severely and not handed. You would all be aware of the great wave of international investment in automated and connected vehicle technologies over the last few years. Here in Australia, General Motors has recently announced its intention to increase, increase its investment to $120 million in Holden to focus on automated and electric vehicles, including research and development. The COAG, uh, that's uh, the Council of uh, of Australian Government's Transport and Infrastructure Ministerial Council, which includes my ministerial counterparts uh, from all states and territories, from all political persuasions, has been actively considering automated vehicles for some time. The Ministerial Council has agreed a national policy framework for land transport technology, so that's a good start and lays out. A three-year work uh, plans to, to deliver a principles-based approach uh, to up the uptake of new transport technology. Whatever the motor vehicle in the future looks like, it's not going to uh, get into the customer's hands without some of the market to sell and to service that vehicle. And having a friendly local dealer who can explain the many new features and benefits to the customer could well become more important <coughs> than ever. Australian governments and industry needs to collaborate to anticipate and adapt the disruption that is coming in terms of the policy and regulatory settings. And please be assured, we'll endeavour to, uh, to say uh, right up to the field in that regard. Uh, this work has been informed and supported by trials and investment right across Australia. Uh, one trial involves uh, transmitters fitted to uh, heavy vehicles and roadside units installed between Port Kembla and the Hume Highway. There. These trials are underway of wireless communications between vehicles, infrastructure and broader networks. An uh, application has been tested including warnings against intersection collisions, forward collisions and emergency braking in heads. So it's all part of this uh, new technology, this new disruption that we are seeing in your industry. Uh, I also know that the Senate is currently inquiring into the use and into the manufacture of electric vehicles in Australia and that the AADA has recently made a very detailed and welcome submission to this particular Senate inquiry. Let me just focus for a moment on, uh, on the specific issue of road safety. Uh, road safety uh, is, is critically important. Now, we have invested $10 billion since 2013-14 uh, to the Bruce Highway Upgrade Program. I mentioned the Bruce before, uh, but whether it's uh, major upgrades on, uh, on significant highways and byways or whether it's a country road, uh, we need to make sure that we continue to invest. Uh, at one end of the scale are those significant national highway upgrades. At the other end of the scale is the Black Spot Program, uh, making sure that uh, local trouble spots are addressed. Uh, it's not good enough that we have 1,200 deaths on our roads per year, and we need to make sure that we continue to work towards zero. Uh, to be identified as a black spot location, of course, we'll have a history of at least three casualty crashes in five years. And since 2013 14, we've funded safety improvements at more than 2,100 black spots. Promoting safer cars is where your industry is helping us to reduce road trauma.
of course, in addition to the uh, 1,200 unfortunate, tragic and unnecessary deaths per year, we have upwards of 30,000 injuries in road crashes. We all know that automotive design changes are occurring rapidly and they're welcome. For example, just a few weeks ago, Holden announced an expansion of their Australian engineering team to develop technologies for automated and electric vehicles. And that is, of course, very welcome. I do a lot of country driving, uh, so I may well wait for driverless cars to pass the kangaroo test before buying one. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm very impatient to see the rapid safety technology advances that are already available in the market being more widely adopted by consumers. That's also why our government is uh, a strong supporter of ANCAP, uh, the Australasian New Car Assessment Program. And we've invested an additional $6.64 million in funding. This will assist ANCAP uh, with its ongoing role in testing and assessing new cars. ANCAP also provides information directly to consumers about vehicle safety. That is important and advocates for improved safety on our roads. Uh, increased market uptake for safer and new and used vehicles uh, is an important element of a new action plan uh, agreed with states and territories in May. The action plan prioritises the most important trauma reduction actions for the government to take over the next three years. And ANCAP ratings, uh, those star ratings, they're good. And of course, there's much more that uh, ANCAP will have. Uh, surely, uh, you know, they know how important it is. They are doing far more uh, than uh, they've ever done in the past. We welcome that and I congratulate them on all the initiatives that they're doing. Um, as well, last year, the independent inquiry was launched into the effectiveness of, uh, of the current strategy of, of the action plan. I look forward to uh, discussing the results and steps with uh, my state and territory counterparts and the Transport and Infrastructure Council uh, very, very soon. I assure you that we will continue to work towards better and safer roads and making sure that we invest where we need to. I also want to thank uh, the AADA members, the dealers, and, uh, and, and those small businesses who really are, back in, in many ways, and often cases, backbones of their community. Transport, particularly in regional areas, is so important. I know I'm uh, uh, in the audience, or I hope he is, he's not even in trouble if I find out, Richard Braid, uh, who I've known for many, many years, uh, Richard, uh, principal of uh, Wagga Motors, a generational family firm in Wagga Wagga. Uh, we, we heard earlier, or we saw earlier, about how businesses, whether it's Brighton, uh, whether it's Wagga Motors, uh, whatever the case might be, invest so heavily into their communities. So I know that Wagga Wagga Motors does that, whether it's sport, whether it's charity, whether it's community events. Uh, without that support, our communities would be so much the poorer. So I say thank you uh, on behalf of the government for all that you do in that regard and that respect. In closing, I know that we're all very aware of the communities we live in and in which we serve. Uh, the staff of your association are well known to many in Canberra, but it's the local dealers, direct, uh, directly and active in local communities, who keep your issues, what should be our issues and are our issues, uh, fresh in the minds of decision makers as we grapple with the many challenges, also the many opportunities, uh, the regulatory uh, uh, the burdens that, uh, that are placed upon you, but making sure that we cut through some of that bureaucracy, making sure that uh, you, know, you are able to operate as well as you can so that you can make a dollar, so that when you make a dollar, we make, uh, we make more taxes, uh, we get more taxes. That's important, we need those to, to pay for our roads, but it also means that you're doing very, very well. And we want you to continue to do very well, not just for our sake, not just for our nation's sake, but indeed, moreover, for the people who you serve and who we serve through that as well. Thank you. I very much appreciate addressing your conference. I look forward to hearing about uh, all about the deliberations and the decisions that you uh, reach and take um, in, the, in uh, the time ahead uh, from David. Uh, he's a wonderful advocate for, uh, for AADA. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen.